Hi, my name is Sergey Levin, and today I'm going to talk about planning with reinforcement learning. So when we think about reinforcement learning, we typically think about behaviors like this. Uh, you're going to train an agent to perform some skill with like a little bit of rewards, perhaps. And the skill is something kind of reactive and fairly short horizon, maybe something that requires some degree of finesse, but not necessarily a degree of uh, really uh, long horizon reason. And when we think about planning, we think about something you know, a little bit like the, um, the ape experiment by uh, Wolfgang Kohler, where uh, a monkey was put in a room with a banana hanging from the ceiling and some boxes. And it looked at the banana, realized that it couldn't reach it, uh, went into the corner of the room, thought for a while about what to do, and then figure out that it can stack the boxes and then reach the banana. Like This is kind of a, a classic example of something that we would think about as long horizon planning, where the monkey clearly had to use some amount of logic and reasoning to figure this out. Or did it? Uh, in the, the 1980s, there was a, an experiment uh, that was done by Epstein and colleagues that was sort of intentionally contrived to challenge this view, where uh, a similar kind of banana and box experiment was repeated with a pigeon. Now, of course, pigeons aren't particularly fond of bananas, much less plastic ones. They also don't eat boxes in order to reach them, but this pigeon was, through reinforcement, trained not to fly, trained to peck at bananas, and also trained to peck at boxes. And what the experimenters observed is that just by putting together these previously uh, ingrained and learned components, it eventually figured out the box trick to peck at the banana, even though it had seemingly uh, no incentive to do that, much less any capacity for the kind of long horizon reasoning and planning that we typically associate with um, higher primates. So and this kind of experiment, of course, is a little bit contrived. It's mainly trying to make a statement, but perhaps it gives us some food for thought. Uh, maybe instead of thinking of planning as a kind of very rigid logical process, we really should think very hard about the interaction of planning and past experience. And perhaps if we think carefully about it, we can actually get a new generation of algorithms that combine elements of learning and planning and utilize them to solve complex and long horizon tasks in real world settings with complex observations like camera images. So reinforcement learning, or learning algorithms more broadly, should give us the capacity to handle complex sensory inputs, like in the example of this grasping robot uh, that learned to pick up objects in dense clutter using just RGB images. And it should also give us the capability to get fine-grained clues with motor skills, like this robot that learned a variety of agile locomotion-style behaviors from a combination of prior data and online experience. Planning should give us more or less what we expect, the ability to construct an intentional course of action meant to achieve some long horizon goal. So we might hope that if we can put these two ideas together, we can get algorithms that can handle complex sensory inputs and provide fine-grained closed-loop motor skills while at the same time solving very long horizon tasks. Not just picking up an object using images, but picking up 50 objects to pack them into a box to fulfill a shipping order, or uh, control that walking robot to walk multiple kilometers over a forest trail uh, to reach a stranded hiker. So that's kind of the promise of being able to put together learning and planning, that we can, on the one hand, put planning in the real world, where it's situated with natural observations and actions, and on the flip side, extend reinforcement learning to complex and long horizon skills. The central thesis of, of my talk today is that learning-based algorithms should give us the representations over which we carry out planning. And in many cases, they can do that with surprisingly little supervision. So, if we think back to this ape example, uh, we could say that the ape used its insight about physics and so on to reason about how to reach the banana, but clearly there was a lot that the ape knew in advance. It didn't spend hours and hours trying to figure out how to pick up a box, uh, and it had some prior knowledge that bananas were tasty and delicious and worth reaching. And then perhaps it had a lot more than that. It probably knew something about stacking objects, and more generally, some intuitive model of physics. So perhaps a reasonable way to think about the intersection of learning and planning is that we're going to get a large body of prior experience, essentially a data set, maybe everything that a robot has ever done before, like cooking dinner, repairing electronics, and cleaning the floors. And we're going to use that to learn some kind of skill model or skill models. And of course, it remains to be decided as to what exactly this skill model or models actually represents, but it, it's some kind of distillation of the robot's prior experience into a form that is amenable for planning. And that's what I refer to as a representation. So we're going to take what we saw before, take our memories, our ex collective experiences, and distill them down to representations that can somehow interact with high-level planning.
So somehow these uh, learned models will be utilized by planning and the planner will somehow provide feedback because in the end it's these learned skills which will actually need to take actions in the world. So of course the big question is what exactly does that interaction look like? What is it that the learned skills give to high level planning and what is it that the planner should give back in return? And that's really the big question uh, that I'll uh, concern uh, that I'll be concerned with in this talk and I'll actually describe a few different potential answers from some of the recent works in my lab. So in this talk I'm going to start with actually a fairly natural way to look at this. I'm going to talk about learning and planning over learned skills. So the abstraction provided by learning will be a set of skills or a continuous space of skills perhaps that are temporally extended and the planner will figure out how to compose them. That's a fairly traditional view but I'll show that um, it can be instantiated in a surprisingly sy simple system that can carry out complex tasks in real-world robotic settings. And then I'll, look, I'll talk about something a little more fine-grained, where instead of constructing long horizon skills, perhaps all we really need to do is take data and train a distribution over plausible behaviors, and then we can essentially con conduct continuous planning inside of this distribution. So this will be a much more fine-grained plan, uh, but I'll show that that too can lead to very good results. And then I'll conclude with uh, maybe something that harkens back to that video of the pigeon, where I'll talk about how maybe if we have the right reinforcement learning algorithm, perhaps we can actually get many of the effects of planning without even explicitly planning at all. But let's start with the simple version. Let's start with planning over learned skills. So uh, as before, uh, we're going to say that we have all this prior experience, and we'll distill, distill the prior experience into a skill model. And what the skill model re will represent in this case is a goal condition policy. So a policy in the parlance of reinforcement learning is a distribution over actions given a state that achieves high reward. And in this case, the policy will also take in a goal. And the objective of this policy will be to take the actions that reach that goal. So of course, there are many ways to essentiate this. We have to actually select a reward function, but it'll be some kind of reward function that rewards the agent for reaching the goal. It could be as simple as just a plus one if it reaches the goal, or it could be something more fine-grained like a distance to the goal. So if we have this kind of goal condition policy, then we could imagine that we can reach far away goals by commanding nearby goals. So it's very hard to train a goal condition policy that will reach all goals in the world. If you could train such a thing, then you wouldn't need anything else. You could just use that policy to solve every problem in existence. But it's much more realistic to imagine that you can learn a policy that can reach a nearby goal. And then you'll want to do some kind of planning to select intermediate sub-goals to go to that will eventually allow you to reach the final goal. So in this example, you have this little quadrupedal robot that's walking around. It starts at S, its goal is to reach G, and the sub-goals are G1, G2, and G3. So how do we choose which goal to command? Well, in order to have a planning algorithm that can do this, we need some other object. We need not just a policy that knows how to take actions to reach goals. We need something that will tell us which goals are valid to command and which ones aren't. Fortunately, Reinforcement learning algorithms already acquire such an object just through natural training, and that's called a value function. So a value function is typically produced as a byproduct of reinforcement learning methods like Q-learning and value iteration, and it gives us an estimate of the expected reward to go from triggering uh, the policy in a particular state S, and if it's a goal condition policy, the value function would also take in G. So if the reward, for example, is minus one for every time step until the robot reaches the goal, then the value function is just the negative of the distance to the goal. If the reward is one when reaching the goal, then it's the probability of reaching the goal. So the value function can be naturally interpreted as some kind of score that indicates how good that, that goal is, how easy is it to reach with the current policy. So then the key idea to compose these goal condition policies with planning is to use the value function as a negative edge cost when planning over sub-goals. So we can do this in a couple of ways. One way is to use graph search. So treat previously seen states as nodes in a graph and construct edges between those nodes uh, where the edge costs come from the value function, just the negative of the value function, and that, and that allows us to use graph search to plan, and that's been done in several prior works. We can also do continuous trajectory optimization, where uh, the sub-goals are states, and the value uh, between each pair is the negative cost. So that we do continuous optimization over sub-goals under the same principle, and that has been done before as well. But what I want to tell you about today is how this idea could be instantiated in some uh, fairly practical robotic navigation systems that can actually uh, reach uh, very distant goals in real world environments. So the kind of system that we'll be trying to build combines learning and planning to perform tasks like uh, delivering objects to uh, a person's doorway and the objective is indicated with an image. So you would go outside, take a photograph of your door and the robot would navigate to that destination. 
So the problem setting is find and navigate to a given goal landmark using only camera observations. So you get the initial observation the robot is seeing, a goal that is provided by the user, and the robot has to actually navigate to that goal. And we're going to basically use the recipe on the previous slide, adapt these image-based uh, uh, robot setting, and we'll train the, the model entirely using previously collected data. So it'll be a very practical kind of supervised learning-based approach. So here's the idea. We're going to have a model that takes in the current observation of the robot sees and an observation of the goal. And the model will try to predict two things. The distance to the goal, essentially the value function, measured here in number of time steps, and the action, uh, which is the action that sh it should take in the current observation to reach the goal. And for now, we'll use a very, very simple algorithm. We'll simply take a data set of navigational data, and for every trajectory, we'll take two time steps along the trajectory, call the first one the current state, the, la the second one the goal state, the number of time steps between them as the distance, and the action taken at the first one as the action label. And then we'll just train this with supervised learning. Once we've trained this, we can use the graph search idea from before, construct a graph over all the observations the robot has seen in the current environment. In reality, there's a little sparsification procedure that we use to make this graph not too big. The edges in the graph are given by the distance from the model, uh, and this can then be used to navigate to faraway goals. So roughly speaking, the model tells you how to reach something that is within the line of sight, and then the graph can allow you to navigate over other landmarks you've seen in this environment to reach a very far away goal. So the graph kind of serves as, as almost like a topological mental map of the environment based on what the robot has seen in that environment before. So of course it requires you to explore the environment in advance to build this mental map. But once you've built it, then you can navigate uh, to very far away destinations in that environment. An interesting thing I want to point out about the system is that the entire system is actually trained on 40 hours of training data uh, that was collected for a completely different project prior to this actually four months prior to, the, to when we did this research. So uh, the convenience of being able to train this model offline is that we can just use a single ever-growing data set uh, and we don't need to do any online reinforcement learning for this. So if we just use this basic version of the method, uh, we can do some uh, fairly interesting tasks. We could, for example, do uh, pizza delivery. Uh, we can give the robot a picture of a front door, put the pizza on the robot, and then the robot uses the combination of this learned goal condition strategy as well as the graph search to navigate to someone's doorway. Uh, we could also do uh, autonomous inspection, where we give it a set of waypoints, and the robot is supposed to patrol between those waypoints by using this graph search and learned model. Okay, but so far this is all for scene environments, where we've already collected a collection of landmarks, uh, and we use those to build the graph. It's built automatically, but it requires the robot to have explored that environment in advance. What about if we're exploring a new environment? So if we have some unseen environment, um, this is our current observation, and then we're told that this is our goal. Well, we've never been in this environment before, but we might have some guess. So we might have some guess that maybe the door looks like it's on a white building and there is a white building in the background, so perhaps we should go and check out that white building to see what's there. So intuitively what we should expect um, a method that combines learning and planning to do in this environment is essentially execute a kind of search strategy where it'll look for plausible places where the goal might be, go and explore those places, maybe with a little bit of randomness, broaden its coverage of the environment, and then as it does so, continue building this mental map, this graph that it can then use to navigate the landmarks. So here's how we're going to do that. Like before, we're going to have a model that takes in the current observation and the goal, and the model will be trained on the same kind of data set. So we're going to take trajectories, take two time steps in each trajectory. The first one becomes a start, the second one becomes the goal, and we will predict the number of time steps between them, as well as the action. But now, we're going to bottleneck the goal observation through what's called a variational information bottleneck. So the variational information bottleneck, intuitively what it does is it says that there's actually a random variable that represents the goal. That random variable is conditioned, in this case, on the start. So um, you can almost think of this as a latent representation of an offset. It's not a spatial offset, it's a kind of a semantic offset. Um, so this latent goal variable is implemented with a variational information bottleneck and it has a prior. So that gives us a choice after the model is trained. We can either feed a real goal image into this model or we can sample the latent goal from the prior and that is essentially going to correspond to a random reachable location in the vicinity of the robot. Or we can get a posterior by using the goal. And then we predict the distance in action like before from the current image and this uh, bottleneck variable. Uh, everything is still trained on exactly the same data set as before. Um, one of the things that you can do with this bottleneck variable is very good exploration. So here we have an overhead satellite uh, image, 
Here the robot explored by triggering random actions, and we can see that it covered uh, something in the radius uh, of about five meters. If we instead sample random latent goals for this goal variable, then it explores much more uh, completely. In fact, here it actually explored the entire region that was available to it at the top. It was, we intentionally blocked it off with a truck so the robot couldn't get out. So it basically covered everything that it could in this environment just by sampling random values for this goal variable. So that's pretty good. The random variable really corresponds to random reachable locations in the robot's vicinity. So then if we, if we use this, what we can do is we can set up an exploration procedure where we're going to sample this random variable when we're on the fringe of the current uh, topological graph, when on the fringe of the current mental map. And when we're not on the fringe, we'll actually use a graph search to navigate to the fringe. And that'll give us this kind of uh, search pattern. So you can see in the satellite view in the lower left that the uh, robot is not just executing a completely random walk, it's actually consciously exploring the periphery of the current space. So it explores the northern end, doesn't find it there, then explores the southern end. And when it catches a glimpse of the door, now there you, you saw that it found the door, then it actually navigates to it. So of course it didn't take a very direct route because it had never seen this environment before, but in the course of exploring this uh, map through a combination of fringe seeking and sampling these random goals, it built a topological map and then the second time around, when we command it to reach that same goal, now it can do it in just 20 seconds instead of 20 minutes because it can reuse the mental map that it built the first time around. So now this learned model is helping the robot to explore and it's helping it build this graph by specifying the edge weights and planning both is effective during exploration because planning is used during exploration to navigate to the fringe and it's effective once the map is built because then it can be used to very rapidly navigate to the goal. Most recently, we've taken this idea and we've extended it uh, to much longer horizon navigation in a system that we call Viking. So the main idea in Viking is to take the search procedure we had before, which you can think of roughly as uninformed search, and essentially turn it into a kind of physical analog of A-star search. So the main idea is to incorporate information from GPS and overhead maps to reach faraway goals. Well, we're not necessarily going to trust GPS or overhead maps because GPS and maps can be wrong. Instead, we're going to incorporate it into the planning procedure as a search heuristic. So um, step one will be just the same as before. We're going to model actions and distances by training a model that takes the current observation and a sub-goal, and it's going to predict a uh, distance in terms of time steps, an action to take, and additionally, it'll also predict now a spatial offset expressed in terms of GPS coordinates, and this will be used for that heuristic later on. And then step two is going to be planning, which is going to use this kind of physical A-star search. And in order to use A-star search, we need a heuristic, and the heuristic will actually be provided by a second model that's going to look at a map, and is going to use these predicted GPS offsets to figure out where the robot is in that map. So the goal of this model is to predict, given the current location of the robot, estimated from GPS, as well as the goal location, also estimated from GPS, potentially incorrect, and given a candidate waypoint that the robot is considering exploring, how likely is that candidate waypoint to reach the, the goal? And that's basically a heuristic. And we're going to train this heuristic using data, using a contrastive loss. So we're going to take all the trajectories we've seen, and now we're going to sample three time steps along those trajectories, where the middle one is the candidate, and we'll basically train this model to guess whether that waypoint lies on the path to the goal. Of course, lying on the path of the goal doesn't mean it's in a straight line path, so it could be that it's a city and maybe it's an intersection that's on the way to the goal, and that's where the map comes in. So it's a learned heuristic model. So now we're going to combine our old model from before, which is going to give us edge costs, as well as our heuristic model, which will give us the heuristic cost-to-go estimate into a kind of physical A-star search. I call it physical A-star search because the robot is actively exploring the environment. So unlike in regular A-star search, where you always take the uh, first node in the queue, now you're going to actually consider where you are now and trade off navigating to a nearby node versus a more optimal node. So at every uh, decision point, what the robot is going to do is going to sample waypoints from this latent variable, just like before, but now instead of simply selecting them at random if it's on the fringe, it's going to actually use this heuristic and uh, just like an A-star search, it's going to go through the nodes it's seen before and pick the one that has the optimal combination of heuristic value as well as distance to go from the present location. Uh, and that'll essentially use the map to bias it to navigate in the direction of the goal. So it's a kind of physical A-star search using a map-based heuristic that gets to look at a satellite image or a road network image. Now, crucially, and I want to emphasize this, the maps and the GPS are used as heuristics, which means that if something in the scene violates uh, its expectations from the map, it'll still use the first-person images to navigate correctly. And we've actually tested this where we have things like a big truck that blocks the way and the robot correctly navigates around that. 
So here's a video of this in action. Here we specified a goal that's uh, about a kilometer and a half away. Uh, in the lower right, you can see the uh, satellite image. Um, and this is also the satellite image that was provided as the heuristic. In the lower left, you can see the robot's first person view. In the upper right, you can see the goal image. And the robot does all sorts of fun things like cut through a field, um, navigate between some trees. Um, towards the end, it's actually going to go into a dead end right about here. Uh, and then it's going to actually backtrack. So you can see that there it actually backtracked and came back out because it realized that it was actually wrong and it couldn't uh, get to the goal because there was an obstruction. So it came back and finally reached the destination. Uh, Viking can navigate to things that are you know, over a kilometer away. We took it on a hiking path that was 2.7 kilometers, although there we do provide some waypoints to keep it on track, to keep it on the path. Um, we did an experiment where uh, during data collection, there was a path uh, in between a building and a fence and then a test time was blocked by a truck. And even though the truck, of course, doesn't appear on the satellite image, the robot was still able to figure out that it should navigate around the truck and reach the goal. Uh, we've also tested Viking where we remo remove the satellite image hint. So that's the pink line here, but still leave GPS. And it kind of does what you expect. It tends to be biased in the direction of the goal, but needs to backtrack more often. So the main idea in these works that I covered is that model-free skills expose their capabilities to the planner via some kind of value function or distance function. And the planner then selects the skills, and the skills in turn select the action. So that's the kind of uh, interface between the planner and the skills that is uh, uh, present in this method. Now, this idea has been explored in a number of other works. So I, I wanted to cover the kind of, uh, perhaps uh, the ones that demonstrated more in realistic settings. Uh, in this paper, though, uh, planning with goal condition policies, uh, we use a similar idea also with images where some goals are now going, going to op be optimized over continuously, so not using our graph search, but actually using a continuous structure optimization method, and it optimizes over latent variables for a generative model to provide a compact space. In this more recent paper, Planning to Practice, we combined uh, the uh, trajectory optimization idea over sub-goals with a hierarchical search procedure that actually doesn't plan over sub-goals one at a time, but actually breaks up the trajectory uh, in a kind of a binary search fashion. And that also can work really well for a variety of robotic manipulation skills. Um, also very recently, uh, we had a method that we developed at Google uh, called SACAN, uh, which also uses learned skills, use the value functions of those skills to expose their capabilities to a higher level planner. But the higher level planner is actually performing semantic reasoning by using a large language model to figure out how to solve semantically indicated tasks. So a user might say, uh, I spilled my drink. Can you help me clean it up? The language model will then propose possible completions that could carry this out, the value functions will decide which of those are feasible in the current environment, and that can be put together into a planning procedure that then solves these semantically indicated tasks, combining semantics from language models with capabilities exposed by value functions of pre-trained skills. All right, so in some ways what I covered in the first part of the talk is sort of a, a very logical hierarchical RL style method. In the next portion, I'm going to talk about how we can have an even more fine-grained planner that still uses prior experience. So let's go back to this picture from before. Um, if we have a bunch of prior data and we're not too concerned with planning, a very simple choice could be to just run imitation learning. So if you have good data that tells you how to do the task, you run imitation learning and you copy that data. But of course, your prior experience in reality doesn't tell you how to do the, the task you're faced with now. It tells you how to do a variety of different things. So what if we use the planner not to sequence skills, but to actually navigate inside of the prior data, to choose parts of prior data to put together to solve the new task. So here the red line kind of combines parts of the black line that we've seen in the prior data, but in a new way to reach a new destination. That's going to be the basic idea in this next section. It's a little bit abstract, but I'll make it more concrete. At a high level, the idea is can we plan inside the data distribution? And there are actually several ways to instantiate this idea that I'll discuss. The first one is called trajectory transformer where the idea is to fit a transformer, a very large generative model, to the data distribution, and then find high probability trajectories that have high reward using beam search. Then I'll talk about an idea that at a high level is very similar, uh, but is implemented in a very different way, which is called deep imitative models. There, the idea is to fit normalizing close to the data distribution, and then find high probability trajectories that carry out the desired task via gradient descent. So the common theme here is step one, fit a density model to the data, and step two, do some sort of planning inside of this density model to find paths the density model believes are realistic um, and that actually accomplish the desired goal. And this has a, a big advantage because it combines the simplicity of imitation learning with the performance benefits of optimal planning. So this is basically going to be a model-based RL uh, approach that combines elements of imitation learning. So let's start with the trajectory transformer. 
The trajectory transformer is actually a very simple model. The goal of the trajectory transformer is to model the distribution over trajectories seen in a data set. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to take our trajectories and we're going to tokenize them. So for every dimension of every state and every action, we're going to discretize that dimension and then we'll model the discretized uh, distribution at every, for every token. And that's very nice because once you discretize per token, uh, you can represent very complex distributions with a very simple and generic model. Of course, the sequence becomes very large. It's the length of the, of the trajectory multiplied by the dimensionality, but it's a very simple model. And then we can use large, very, po very powerful sequence models like transformers, which can represent these distributions very accurately. But what does this really give us? Well, it gives us the, prob the ability to generate high probability trajectories. Uh, so the tokenized trajectory is just broken up by dimension. Every dimension of every state, action, and, or reward is a token. And then the model represents a distribution over trajectories. Now, this distribution over trajectories can be conditioned on the initial state, and then it gives you a distribution over completions. You can also condition it on actions, and then we'll uh, figure out the states that correspond to those actions. So it's a very flexible model. And it can represent very complex behaviors. So this is a 25-dimensional, um, roughly, humanoid uh, and the model is making accurate predictions out to hundreds of time steps. This is significantly better than what you could do if you were to use standard autoregressive models. But of course, our goal is not just to predict what the humanoid will do. Our goal is to control it by using this model. So step two is planning. And how are we going to do planning? Well, we're, go we're going to do planning by trying to find trajectories that get a high reward and that the trajectory transformer thinks are likely to actually be feasible trajectories. So. The idea is that we're going to maximize, with respect to the actions and states, uh, and rewards actually, uh, the log probability of that sequence under the transformer. Uh, but that's just going to decode the most likely sequence. Uh, we, and we know how to do this. We can do this using beam search. That's a standard way to decode from transformer models. But then we'll also add to it the sum of rewards. So we're optimizing over the rewards because they're modeled by our model. So we'll also maximize those rewards. And we just add that to the beam search log likelihood one when we decode. So it's a very simple modification to a standard uh, beam search procedure that is already very well developed for these transform models. Now, in reality, we might not want to do the search over the full horizon of the problem. So as this classical model predictive control, we might add a terminal value function to this. And that value function can come from any other method, including any offline reinforcement learning method. So that's basically the idea. Uh, now, trajectory transformer was designed first and foremost as an offline reinforced learning algorithm. So we tested it on offline reinforced learning benchmarks. We found that on the relatively simple benchmarks uh, based on Mujoko locomotion, the trajectory transformer performed about the same as state-of-the-art uh, model-free RL methods. Um, so uh, you know, these are just some prior approaches, and this is a trajectory transformer, so it kind of seems like it's not making much of a difference. But then we tested it on the, uh, the AntMaze benchmarks, and these are benchmarks that are specifically designed to evaluate planning capability. So the way that these benchmarks work is that the ant is supposed to navigate from one corner of the maze to the other, but all the data that's trained on contains parts of trajectories that travel between two points, but there's no single trajectory that, that travels from the very start to the very goal. So you're supposed to combine parts of those trajectories via planning to reach a distant goal. So it's very much like this example that I had before. And on the ant maze example, the trajectory transformer significantly outperforms previous methods. So this is a, this IQL this is a state-of-the-art model-free offline RL method. Decision transformer is a kind of behavior cloning style method, uh, but that also uses transformer models. And this is the trajectory transformer, which basically combines density modeling and planning. Um, this method actually maxes out on some of the tasks uh, and achieves the best performance on the others. So this combination of behavior cloning, uh, essentially density modeling, and planning can work very well on very challenging uh, benchmark tasks. And next, let me talk about deep imitative models, which on the surface is a very different approach, but it's based on very similar principles. Now, deep imitative models actually precedes trajectory transformer and was designed specifically with kind of autonomous driving tasks in mind, but it's based on very similar principles. So the idea is that we're going to fit a normalizing flow to a data distribution and then find high probability trajectories that reach some goal. So step one is going to be just like before density modeling. This is going to be in an autonomous driving setting. We're going to get data from a bunch of human drivers navigating to different locations. And what we're going to learn is a model that predicts future uh, waypoints that the car will visit given the current observation, in this case, the current LIDAR observation. So uh, the probability of a path, like turning left or right at an intersection, given the current LIDAR measurement. And that's what we call an imitative model. So it's a model over future uh, points that the car will go to 
given the current context, which is the liner. And essentially, you can think of this as answering the question, what are all possible future paths a human driver might take? And then step two is going to be planning. And it's going to be done in much the same way as with a trajectory transformer. We're going to optimize over a sequence of positionings to maximize their log probability under the imitative model, as well as to minimize their cost. So if we want the car to reach a particular destination, then the cost might represent the distance to that destination. And there are actually two interpretations of this planning approach. One is that we're going to add the log probability under the model to the cost. And another one is we're going to do inference where the probability of a path reflects its like, the likelihood that a human would take that path, as well as the likelihood that it actually reaches the goal. Now, why might we want to do this? Well, the reason that this might work really well, for example, in an autonomous driving setting, is that the imitative model will capture kind of human conventions. It'll capture the notion that you should drive on the right side of the road, yield to other cars at a stop sign, and so on. Whereas the goal will capture the desire for the driver to go to a particular location. So combining these, uh, we don't need the cost to reflect things like rules of the road or avoiding collisions, because those are already reflected by the imitative model. So that's a really powerful idea. So the cost, you can think of it as the negative log probability of the goal. So here's a schematic uh, illustration of deep imitative models. We're going to take training data, that's at the top, from human drivers, and we'll learn to predict distributions over future paths that human drivers might take, given the current LIDAR observation. If the driver is, for example, at an intersection, this distribution might be, might be multimodal. There's high probability of going left, high probability of going right, but very low probability of swerving and hitting a stop sign because humans don't typically do this. And then we're going to give a goal to the uh, agent, maybe by specifying uh, the road path that the agent should follow. You can roughly think of this as basically what Google Maps gives you. Uh, and then we're going to optimize a path that's going to have high probability under the imitative model, so that's going to tell the agent not to do things like swerve and hit a stop sign, and also minimizes the cost of the goal, which will get it to go in the right direction. We can impose additional costs, like tell it to avoid potholes on the road and that sort of thing. So here's a video of the deep imitative model in action. So on the left, you can see the, uh, the LIDAR measurements. The orange diamonds show the, uh, the waypoints that are provided as the goals, and the red circles show the path selected by the model. Now the model is choosing to stop behind other cars, stop at lights, etc., and that's all learned behavior. So the goals aren't telling it to stop behind the cop car here or to wait at the light. That's all being decided by the deep imitative model because not doing so, actually colliding with a car, would be uh, very unlikely under the imitative model. So a lot of the common rules of the road, collision avoidance, and, and so on, is actually determined by the probabilistic model itself. Um, here I'm going to show some uh, stress testing experiments. Here we show what happens when we set the waypoints much further away. Now, when we set them further away, the car does swerve a little bit, but it generally still stays on the road, so the waypoints don't need to be very close together. Here we intentionally introduce noise into the waypoints. So here the, the green crosses, those are the waypoints that are provided to the car. They have a lot of noise, but the car doesn't actually follow the waypoints tightly. It intentionally understands that it should stay on the right side of the road, even though the waypoints sometimes would tell it to drive on the sidewalk. So the imitative model is really figuring out how to avoid the bad stuff. Now, if we give it a very high cost for driving over what we call potholes that are indicated with the red uh, points on the, on the right, then we'll correctly avoid them. If the um, waypoint system is accidentally set to UK mode and the waypoints are all on the left side of the road, the car correctly ignores that and stays on the right side, but drives in the right direction. So you can see that the combination of learning and planning actually leads to something that is better than either of the two by themselves. The learn model captures uh, reasonable human behavior, and the planning component allows you to actually decide how to reach the destination properly. Okay, so in the last portion of this talk, I, I want to actually move away from planning a little bit and actually argue that in some cases, just learning algorithms themselves can actually perform a sort of planning during training. So if we go back to the pigeon example, in so part of the point that was being made by Epstein and colleagues in this experiment is that through appropriate conditioning in advance, the pigeon can very readily figure out how to combine the skills that it was taught, essentially through reinforcement. So while it may be that the pigeon really is planning how to move the box and how to reach the banana, uh, perhaps a more likely explanation is that the combination of experience that it's seen before somehow uh, gives it the common sense necessary to figure out how to do the task. And what I want to talk about in this next part of the talk is how common sense can emerge from reinforcement learning, how essentially reinforcement learning can perform something that looks very much like planning uh, during the training process. So 
Um, the pigeon example is a little bit abstract, uh, but let's talk about a simpler, more natural example. Let's say that you would like a, a robot to cut some onions, and you've trained a really good skill for cutting onions. But now when you put the robot in your kitchen, the onions are hidden away in a drawer, so the robot can't just immediately deploy its onion cutting skill. It needs to open a drawer, take out a knife, uh, maybe take out the onions, and start cutting them. So this is not something that people really have problems with. Like, you know that if you need to cut onions, you need to go get a knife somewhere. You might not know exactly where the knife is, but you would basically figure out that you need to check the drawers. But if the robot only has an onion cutting skill, it of course has no way to know this. Uh, that's not entirely unlike the pigeon, because the, the pigeon uh, knows it needs to reach the banana. Maybe it was trained to do so, but the banana is high up on the ceiling. Um, it also has to figure out which other skills it needs to combine in order to perform this task. So here's how we can do this without explicit planning and test time. If you learned to cut the onion, then you know that the state where there's an onion in front of you and you are holding a knife is a good state. Your value function will tell you that you have a high value if you have a knife and an onion in front of you. But now imagine that you also have a bunch of prior experience of other tasks that do not involve cutting onions, the prior data. Maybe the prior data includes some examples where you opened a drawer. Maybe it includes some examples where you picked up a knife. Maybe it includes some examples of other things. Uh, if you know that the state where you're holding a knife is a high value state, then you will realize that it is also a high value state in your prior data. And therefore things in your prior data that led to that state, even though they never participated in the onion cutting skill, are also high value states. So you can chain things backwards through time through value-based reinforcement learning methods. Now, of course, in reality, your prior data might contain a bunch of other things like making soup and cutting carrots and making bread that are irrelevant. So these would not be high value states. But when you have those high value states in your prior data, you can connect them to other states that precede them, like opening a drawer, even though you've never actually opened a drawer to take out a knife and then cut an onion before. So the idea is that we want to chain together these paths. We want to figure out that transitions seen in the prior data should have high value uh, because they lead to states that have high value for the current task. Propagation of values through Bellman backups can connect prior knowledge to new tasks. And in fact, what I'm going to show is that it can do so without any explicit planning at test time. Uh, but this requires us to run reinforcement learning with prior data. So it requires offline reinforcement learning algorithms. Uh, I'm not going to talk in detail about offline reinforced learning algorithms in this talk, um, but I'll, I'll reference the particular algorithm that we use. So here's the actual experiment that we ran to understand this, and this is in a paper by Avi Singh called COG. Uh, we have a robot that's supposed to perform some task, in this case to pick up a ball from an open drawer. But then at test time, we're going to mess with the robot. We're going to uh, put it in front of a closed drawer. Now, of course, if the policy was only trained on open drawers, if the drawer was closed, the robot won't know what to do. So just like in the onion example from before, we're going to give the robot a variety of prior examples of other skills that it could do. So this is basically that prior data of, of, of other skills that it knows, just like with the monkey. Uh, and some of the data will involve opening drawers. Some of it will involve doing other things like moving bottles out of the way, closing drawers. Some of the data will be relevant and some of it will be irrelevant. So the problem set up is that you have data for your new task, in this case, picking up the ball from an open drawer. The data, that data has sparse zero one rewards, and you have to learn from images, uh, and you only show the task from a single starting condition. The prior data has no rewards at all because none of the prior data includes performing the desired task. And it doesn't accomplish the new task, but it might contain skills that are useful to perform the new task from other initial states. The methodology will be very simple. We'll simply take the training data, take the prior data and label it with rewards of zero, and combine it into a single data set for use with value-based offline reinforcement learning. In this case, we're just going to run conservative Q-learning. And that's it. That's the entire approach. And then we're going to evaluate this method from new initial states and show that it exhibits uh, the kind of behaviors that we might expect from a planning method. So uh, quantitatively, it performs significantly better than, for example, imitating the data or performing offline RL without the prior data. Uh, but qualitatively, I think the results are, the, are, are most interesting to see. So here's the basic training task. This is normal. We expect the robot to be able to do this. Here's what happens when the drawer is closed. The robot opens the drawer and picks up the ball. Even though it has never seen a complete episode where the drawer is opened and the ball is picked up. It's seen episodes where the drawer gets opened in prior data, and it's seen episodes where the ball gets picked up, but it's also seen a bunch of distractions. Here we're going to force it to do three steps. The top drawer is open, 
which means the robot has to close the top drawer, open the bottom one, and then pick up the ball. Here the drawer is blocked by another object, so the robot has to lift an object out of the way, open the bottom drawer, and then pick up the ball. So now it's stitching together three steps. And we can do this in the real world too, so we can have the robot uh, open a drawer, in this case, and pick up an object out of the drawer, uh, which is a stuffed animal. Again, by combining prior experience of opening and closing drawers, and experience for this task of picking up objects from open drawers. This is also, I should say, a physically fairly nuanced task, because pulling out open the drawer with such a small robot is a little bit difficult. So, the main point I wanted to make with this work is that, uh, while combining learned skills with planning is a very effective way to solve long horizon tasks, if we have the right data-driven reinforcement learning methods, we could also imagine performing some notion of common sense reasoning, some notion of planning even, even during the training process. So I talked about planning over learned skills, planning inside the data distribution, and a kind of planning that could be done even without any actual planning. So some takeaways. Data-driven or experiential learning can provide representations for planning. If there's one thing that uh, I would like everyone to take away from this talk, it's basically this uh, central thesis. Uh, it can do so in a variety of ways. You can learn closed loop skills, and if these skills expose their capabilities to a planner, they can be planned over. You can learn uh, action representations and dynamics, and learn models that simply represent the distribution of the data can be used uh, in, inside of a planning method to plan over things that are physically plausible. You can also just do dynamic programming and stitching, and value-based RL methods can directly solve a kind of planning problem during the training process if provided with the right data. Uh, but while these are different approaches to essentially the same problem, there are a number of key themes that they all have in common. Data, offline or online data, tells the system how to handle complex input-output relationships, uh, like images and motor commands, to attain near-term outcomes. And planning, whether explicit planning or ex implicit planning via dynamic programming, uses these relationships to solve long-horizon tasks. And this combination can be very powerful because it can allow us to perform planning-style reasoning with raw image observations and with complex motor commands, including in the real world of the robotic systems. Thank you very much for listening. I would like to especially thank the students that carried out this research. Um, uh, and you can check out the, uh, our lab website for references to papers, code, and so on. Thank you very much.